thank you all for coming. We've decided that hot summer nights are also good for crowds. Light rains, hot summer nights, they're all wonderful. They all come. <laughs> thank you so much for coming. I truly appreciate you being here tonight. If we've not met, my name is Frank Bowles. I'm the director of the Clark Historical Library. And I am delighted tonight to introduce, introduce our speaker, Robert Knapp. Um, Robert has had a distinguished academic career at the University of California, Berkeley. He has published extensively on topics in Roman history. He has his most, one of his most recent books, uh, Invisible Romans, was published by Harvard University Press. But we don't care about any of that tonight. What we really care about is that Robert's great-grandfather, do I have that right, Robert, great-grandfather? Great-grandfather settled in Clare, Michigan. Uh, Robert has returned to Clare. He has restored the log cabin home that his pioneering great-grandfather constructed. And apparently, not being able to give up his bookish research ways, he has begun researching local books. Tonight's topic is Mystery Man, Gangsters, Oil, and Murder in Mid-Michigan. And yes, there will be copies available for sale at the reception. <laughs> And with that introduction, Robert? Well, thank you very much, uh, Frank, for that, uh, for that kind introduction. Um, I was actually uh, uh, raised in Mount Pleasant, so I'm not quite as far away uh, as it might, uh, might seem from my California uh, residence address. Um, and my interest in, uh, in local history um, goes back to not only my great-grandfather, but my grandmother and my father, who were all from, um, from Clare. Before I say, uh, begin with my talk, though, I want to um, express my appreciation to Frank and all that that Clark Library um, does in preserving resources for, um, for local history, um, the, uh, particularly the newspaper collection, but also the images that the Clark um, has accumulated, um, and also a couple of manuscripts that would have just disappeared into nothing. Um, appeared in the archive of the Clark and were very helpful to me. So I'm very appreciative of him, of his hard work and all the people at the Clark for, for what they do in preserving um, stuff for Michigan, resources for Michigan um, history. We're going to talk about two people this evening, um, mostly. One is Isaiah Leboff, whom you see here with his two dogs on the morning before he was murdered. He did a photo shoot for the Clare Sentinel. Little did he know that this picture would find its way nationwide um, within uh, about 48 hours. The other person that we'll be talking a lot about is Carl Jack Livingston. Um, and these two uh, fellows, um, work together, become separated, work together again, and ultimately become separated um, at the end of Isaiah's life. And so um, what I'm going to talk about um, focuses on these two, on these two characters. They begin their relationship in the oil fields of Tulsa. Um, on, the, uh, on the left is Tulsa in 1893. Let's see if I can get my pointer to work here. Um, and here is Tulsa in, 18, uh, in uh, 1905, um, just after the Glen Pool discovery, which um, rocketed um, uh, Oklahoma to the um, leading oil producing state in the country. This oil attracted uh, the Livingstons, Carl Livingston's father, who was an immigrant from Eastern Europe, uh, spent some time um, as a peddler, got into the oil business, and ended up in Tulsa with his, um, with his family. And that is also where um, they were involved first with pipelines and then ultimately in actual um, uh, discovery and refining. And here are the Livingstons. Um, and Jack is, uh, or Carl, as he was born, and Jack as he was later known as here. Here's uh, the patriarch, Nathan, and the Livingston Oil Company. So Carl comes from an oil family. He was, however, not particularly, um, what I want to say, focused as a young man. And in 1909, he begins his uh, career, which I think of as his uh, showmanship. He 
he does crazy things all his life, and I will talk about a number of those crazy things as we go along. But the first crazy thing he does starts in 1909 with his brother Herman. They make a bet with a local newspaper that they can um, work their way to Seattle for the Alaska Yukon Pacific ex uh, Exhibition. They can earn their way there and back and come back with $500 in their pocket, all, never taking employment beneath a gentleman. Um, and uh, they actually do this. Uh, they actually do this in about a six month, uh, about a six month tour. So that's where Jack begins to show his showmanship, his, his desire for attention, his, his interest in being um, out front. Because one of the things he did while he was going to Seattle was to perform in vaudeville. And he particularly prided himself on being a song and dance man. I, I hate to think what Nathan and, and Anna uh, Livingston thought of their son uh, doing this. Now, for those of you that don't know what a song and dance man is, Okay, so this is the sort of thing that Jack did on stage. Anybody know who that is? It is Eddie Cantor. Good for you. Okay, I couldn't get a pic. I couldn't get a video of um, of Jack himself. But this is what he loved to do. He loved to be up in front of audiences. Then World War I came, 1917, the United States gets into the war. Jack decides in his typical showman fashion that he's going to be a star. He's going to go over there and drop dynamite on the Hun. So he volunteers for the Army Air Corps because that's what he wants to do. He wants to fly one of those things. He wants to drop a bomb that looks like that. He wants to be one of these guys um, right here. Unfortunately, the Army Air Corps decided he was much better as a showman than as a bomber, and he ends up not over in France at all, he never gets there, but rather selling Liberty Bonds. So he's sent around, mostly in the West, as far away as Los Angeles, um, and he, um, along with many other um, uh, famous people like uh, Charlie Chaplin and Douglas Fairbanks, they had um, public, um, public sessions in which they touted these Liberty Bonds. So that's what Jack, poor Jack, he never did get to drop dynamite on the Hun. After, he, after World War I was over, he came back and uh, again worked in the, Tulsa, um, in the Tulsa oil fields because that, of course, was uh, his, his family's, uh, still his family's business. Now, what did Jack do? Jack was what's called a lease man. He was very good at going around to farmers and saying, and, 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 you know, having a beer with them or a coffee or whatever, and talking them into signing a, an oil lease, such as this one. This is actually from Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, down here, um, so that they would get their one eighth if oil was found on their property. And Jack, again, shows himself in his showman fashion, very personable, very social. He is very good at this, and he will, be, he will reappear when we see him in uh, Michigan. So that is the Livingston family. The other in, uh, person that we're going to be particularly concerned about is Isaiah Lebov. Isaiah's family also is from Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern European Jews, as, uh, as Livingston's family was. They, his family ends up in Pittsburgh. He gets a good high school education. He goes to Cumberland University in Tennessee and gets a law degree. Now, why might he go to say, Cumberland University, you would ask? Probably you're not asking that, but I'm going to answer the question anyway. Because Cumberland was, was perhaps the last school in the country to have a one-year law degree. So, so you could graduate with a BA, as Leboff did, in finance and law um, in a four-year career. He took, he took himself west to Tulsa. 
in his university days, he had met a lot of people. He was involved in the uh, law society group and, and other, uh, in athletics and so on. And a, a number of people in his class headed west to after graduation, here's his graduation picture, to take advantage of the oil fields. And at the time of the, in, of the draft of the First World War, 1917, June, he is in Tulsa. And not only is he in Tulsa, but he is rooming at the Livingstons' home. So in some fashion that I was never able to track down, he came to the attention of Nathan Livingston as a sharp young lawyer, and he practices for the Livingston Oil Corporation. And this is where he and Carl um, first, um, first come together. In Tulsa, he's the sharp attorney. Um, Livingston is the good lease person. Um, and they also share a fondness for gambling, which will um, carry them through the rest, uh, the rest of their lives. But in Tulsa, they're very, they're very successful. But Tulsa is much too small for um, Isaiah Lebov, who, as you can see in this 1919 um, picture, um, is a, a dashing young man. And while working for the Livingstons, he had made a number of trips to New York, as did the other Livingston uh, boys, on oil business and, and social, um, uh, so, social, for social reasons. And he fell in love with New York and decided he would move to New York. He also, in those New York trips, had his first contact with New York gangsters. When he comes to New York in 1921, he immediately hooks up with one of the most famous of the um, of the New York gangsters. Anybody know who this guy is? You've seen him in two movies. <laughs> so the, uh, up here um, is, uh, or down there, is uh, Howard De Silva in the 1974 <coughs> uh, version of The Great Gatsby. And up here is uh, Bakan in the 2013 version of uh, The Great Gatsby. Because Arnold Rothstein appears um, as a figure, Mayor Wolfsheim, in, um, in The Great Gatsby. This man was, is most famous for his fixing of the 1919 uh, World Series, um, in which the, the Black Sox, uh, Shulis Joe Jackson and, uh, and uh, other uh, famous people, um, were convicted of, of throwing the, um, uh, the 1919 World Series. Rothstein, of course, always denied everything. He had nothing to do with this. Um, but he was a great gambler. And this is one of the things that attracted him to uh, Lebov and attracted Lebov to him. And Rothstein becomes Lebov's mentor. And, and uh, Lebov becomes his, uh, one of his agents. Um, the, he hung out, that is Rothstein, uh, hung out at Lindy's in uh, New York, famous gangster hangout. And he picked up a lot of the habits of the New York gangsters, not the least of which is hooking up with showgirls. Gangsters and showgirls um, go together. And at the, at the, uh, at the top here is, um, is uh, Nikki Arnstein. And this is, uh, this is Fanny Bryce here. And uh, of course, that's where Funny Girl comes from. And here's Omar Sharif and, uh, and Barbara Streisand in the, uh, uh, in the, in the film. So gangsters did this fairly regularly. Um, Rothstein here with Carolyn Green, his particular, uh, or longest uh, uh, surviving, if you will, girlfriend. Um, and here is Legs Diamond with his uh, girlfriend, Kiki um, Roberts. So Lebov, in this environment, also um, gets involved with uh, showgirls. Show, the showgirls, uh, the most famous ones, of course, are Ziegfeld Follies, but, um, but Lebov's girl came from George White's scandals. Now, all of these are, um, feature uh, large events um, with uh, sometimes fairly scantily clad um, um, girls. And it, just in case you don't know what this is. <laughs>
That's the 1929 Ziegfeld Follies, but it would have been exactly that kind of program that, um, the, that e e Enid Seaton, the showgirl that, that Leboff hooks up with, would have been in. This is George White himself. Um, when George White asked, was asked how many of his girls marry millionaires, he said, all the smart ones. Uh, another version of the story uh, is that he replied, all that could. So, she, Enid Seaton is the woman that Lebov fell in love with and ultimately married. After years, literally, and, and, and looking everywhere, I've never been able to find a picture of this uh, beautiful uh, woman. So what did she look like? We know that she had uh, red hair because everyone said that she was a Titian-haired beauty. So did she look like Clara Bow or Jean Harlow or Sean Houston or perhaps a sophisticated lady such as this person or this person or this person? So what did she look like? And I don't know and I would love to be able to find out, to find any picture. I was told by uh, one of Lebov's nieces that she hated to have her picture taken, despite the fact that she was gorgeous. And that's why even in family pictures, there, there was never, she, so the niece claimed, never a picture of Enid. But Lebov fell head over heels, they married, and they stayed married um, throughout, their, throughout their life, although they had no, no children. So he's in New York, he's gambling with Rothstein, he's learning his trade, he is what they called a, um, a mouthpiece for the gangsters. This is William Fallon, the most famous of the mouthpieces. What a mouthpiece does is, air, is um, lend legitimacy to a gangster's actions. So something the gangster does or is accused of doing something or does something, Fallon or Lebov is trotted out saying, oh, well, you know, Rothstein would never do anything like this. He's really a nice guy. He hands out turkeys at Christmas. Um, they were the legitimate front for, um, for, um, for, these, uh, for gangsters. And so that was what Lebov did in the late 20s in New York for Rothstein. A final way that he mimicked Rothstein was his interest in the theater. Gangsters sponsored a lot of theater in New York, both serious theater and also um, the musical theater, such as the, the, the Follies or, and their equivalent. Uh, Lebov followed in this, uh, in, in, in this manner and actually produced a play uh, called New York, which was shown uh, in November of 1927 in the Mansfield uh, Theater um, for eight performances, and it was completely, um, completely panned. There's actually a review of it in the New York Times. Um, so uh, it was said to be salacious, um, but uh, the New York Times said that uh, one person's salaciousness is another one's ennui. Uh, so it, it closed after eight days, but it is interesting that he was picking up all of these um, traits that the gangsters he was hanging around with had. Rothstein is uh, murdered after, <clears throat> after a, um, uh, a gambling episode. Um, he's murdered and suddenly Lebov is without someone to work with and to uh, protect him. He'd worked with other gangsters, Legs Diamond, Dapper Dan Collins, um, but it was really Rothstein that was his, his person. So he felt that he needed to leave New York um, at this point, in 1920, after the murder in 1928. Where would he go? And there are lots of places where you can go if you leave New York. His sister, Florence, he had four sisters. His sister, Florence, married a, a pew. Now the pews, you know from all the, all the uh, foundations and so on that they do, but you may not know that it's oil money, it's Sunoco, is pew money. So, the be and Sunoco was interested in oil in Michigan. So the best guess is that Lebov had some connections through his, um, uh, his sister, his brother-in-law, uh, Thomas Pugh, and Sun Oil, and that's the, one of the reasons, at least, why he came to Michigan. He also had relatives in Detroit, 
um, who were involved in gambling. Um, and uh, that may have been another reason why he chose Michigan. Now, for whatever reason, he comes back to Michigan and back to his oil roots. Uh, because in 1925, the first, the discovery, uh, well, I mean, Jack is, Westbrook is sitting here. I've got to be really careful about what I say about oil. Uh, the discovery well in Saginaw in 1925, then Greendale Township uh, between, uh, Isabel, between Isabel County and Midland in 1928, then Vernon Township, which is the township directly south of Clare in 1929. So oil was big time at exactly in Michigan at exactly this time. Um, here you see the Buckeye Discovery Well in Saginaw, and Clare was just a sleepy little town um, after in, in, in 19, about 1,800 people in, in the 1920s. Um, but when oil was discovered, then it almost doubled in population overnight. So this was a possible uh, place to come, and and come he did. And not only did he come, but he picked, he hooked up again with Jack Livingston, who had been doing some other things that I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, but he, Jack came to Michigan as well, and the two worked together to um, do oil discovery, to do oil investment, um, and to do leasing, of course, which is what um, what he did, what Jack did, um, did the very best. Uh, this is a uh, sign for the mammoth. Um, uh, petroleum uh, company, which is the name of the company that um, that Lebov, um, this is Lebov here, that Lebov um, uh, managed at this point. But not, it wasn't just Jack that came. It wasn't just um, Isaiah that came. It was also members of the notorious Purple Gang. This is a terrible 1959 movie about it, but hey. There you go. All right. Purple Gang. So, kidnapping, Purple Gang, but first, let me introduce you to the leader of the Purple Gang. Um, this uh, this uh, uh, young man um, is uh, Joey Bernstein, look, looking quite dapper, as gangsters uh, usually did. He was the leader of the Purple Gang, which um, was involved in a famous murder in 1931. So remember now, try to keep all this straight. Oil's discovered in Clare in 1929. Lebov is there dealing with oil. Livingston is there. Uh, the Purple Gang is becoming interested. And then in 1931, in the Collingwood Avenue massacre, um, these three rival gangsters are killed by four Purple Gang members. Um, these fellows right here, Harry Keywell, Ray Bernstein, and Irving Milberg were caught. The fourth one escaped and, and actually wasn't caught for quite some time. They were caught, they were put on trial, as they say, they were given a fair trial and convicted um, almost overnight. So by September of 1931, these three Purple Gang members found themselves residents of Marquette um, Prison in the Northern, the Northern Peninsula um, for these murders. So the Purple Gang has suffered a great loss in three of its leaders, um, and they are weakened in Detroit. They begin to look much more seriously outside of Detroit for ways to um, invest their money uh, and, um, and, and uh, continue, to, continue to operate. And guess where that oil might be? It might be in Clare. Now, it wasn't just gangsters that were doing this, that were investing in Clare oil. The, the fellow here on the left is, um, is T. Carl Holbrook, um, who was uh, the Clare County uh, prosecutor. I'm sorry, he's, this is Holbrook, um, the, the Clare County prosecutor. And this is Ben Carpenter, who was a state senator. So everybody was piling into these, this oil um, investment. I don't want to just think it's gangsters. But it did attract the, the, uh, the attention of um, particularly Sam Garfield, who was um, a, 
a front man, not exactly the same sort as Lebov, but um, a front man for the Purple Gang in, um, um, in, in, in Detroit. And he hooked, he met Lebov, um, very interesting story, which I will not uh, go into, you can read the book, um, met, uh, met Garfield and, um, and Lebov, and became a close friend of Lebov and, uh, in oil exploration and oil, um, uh, in, in, and working with the Purples in oil. Here's his home on East 6th Street in Clare, you can still um, go by there today and eventually he formed his own oil company. But he starts out with the Mammoth Oil Company with, um, with Lebon. So the, but the main thing that the Purples are really interested in at this point is getting their, their buddies, and Ray Bernstein is Joey's, one of Joey's brothers, out of Marquette. So we, be, we, we enter into a fairly complex situation in which Lebon is working with the Purples in their oil, but also is working for them, supposedly for a retainer of $30,000, to try to get these guys out of Marquette. Um, so, how does he do that? Well, who do we have here? It, it looks like the Lone Eagle. you might ask, are we doing with Charles Lindbergh? Well, this is what we're doing with Charles Lindbergh. <laughs> this child back. A $50,000 um, note was left by the kidnappers demanding $50,000 for the return of the child. They immediately thought of gangsters as kidnappers and specifically of the Purple Gang because um, the Purple Gang was notorious for, among other things, um, kidnapping people for ransom. Two men were, came, were brought forward, Salvi Spitali and Irving Britz, um, who were in, uh, in, in jail in New York at the time, who said that they could find the baby. And this is the note that Charles and Anne wrote um, saying that they would uh, cooperate with, uh, with Spitali and Bits um, if they could find the child. They said they had a contact in Michigan who could find the child. 
And that contact in Michigan was Isaiah Leboff. So the newspaper, the Los Angeles Times and uh, other, other uh, uh, newspaper um, correspondents rush to uh, Claire um, and Leboff says that he's sure that the baby is going to, be, um, going to be free. What's going on here? What's going on is that the hope was to use the kidnapped baby to get the purples out of Marquette, either through on a parole or on a new uh, or on a new trial, and Lebov was involved in trying to make that happen. Uh, there's a much more elaborate plot um, by Governor Bruckner, Brucker um, that tries to accomplish the same the same thing. Of course, the baby is dead. The baby was murdered almost immediately after it was kidnapped. So all of this was never going to happen. Um, but the point is, uh, Lebov was involved in this way in trying to get the people out of Marquette. The next way that he tries to get the people out of Marquette is to become close buddies with William Comstock, who um, it was governor of Michigan from 1933 uh, to 34. Um, and Comstock was elected with the help of Lebov's money. So after he was elected, um, he was appointed, yes, prison inspector. <clears throat> and um, without salary, and just because he was a great guy, according to Governor Comstock, um, and everybody immediately assumed that he was trying to get these purples out of Marquette. And there was a uh, legislative hearing in New York. This is a man named, uh, named Smith. Um, who had hearings in uh, Lansing investigating this connection between Lebov the, the, and the governor. And this is when Lebov was first called a mystery man, the mystery man of Michigan politics. So we leave now Lebov in Claire, working for the Purples, working for them both in the oil fields and trying to get their, uh, their buddies out of uh, Marquette, and we go back to Jack. Now remember I left you with Jack as a, a showman, and in the 10 years between uh, 19, about 1920 and 1930, when uh, Lebov and Livingston are together, Livingston really does um, sort of go off the deep end. Um, and he assumes other people's, um, he assumes other people's identities. There's a, an actor, Jack Livingston, um, who is a unknown, he's a B actor uh, in the silent movies, but uh, Jack, our Jack Livingston took on his persona, claimed that he had been in, in movies, claimed even that he had dated Gloria Swanson, uh, one of the movies that, um, that Jack Livingston was in. If that wasn't enough, that is if Jack Livingston as actor wasn't enough, Jack also impersonates a famous aviator whose name is Jack Livingston. And he claims that he is going to be the first person to fly around the world. While he post is the first person to do this in 1933, some years later. Um, but Jack says that that's what he's going to do. And he also says, boasts in this Daily Mirror article, that he would have beaten Lindbergh across as the, as the first solo, solo flight across the Atlantic, except that he had had engine trouble. So, so Jack is pretending to be these famous people. He so desperately wants, um, wants attention. He's up in Claire now, having not, not an aviator, not an actor. He's up in Claire now, after about 1930, leasing oil wells, working for Mammoth Oil for a while, and he really settles in. People really like him. As I said from the beginning, he's an easygoing guy. People, uh, people get along well with him. Here he is uh, smoking a cigar at one of his oil wells. Here he is leading, this is in Claire, this is a 4th of July parade that he's, um, that he's leading here. And you can see uh, that he was chosen as the judge um, in the Miss Central Michigan uh, contest at Bud Lake in 1936. You can see his sash here says Miss Take. And uh, these are, uh, people may know these people. Here's, uh, here's uh, Virginia Collins from Claire. Um, Joyce Williams actually won the contest from uh, Mount Pleasant and Josephine Ladd. There's also somebody from Gladwin and, and uh, other places. The point is that, that, jo that Jack was really well liked, became really well liked just as a, um, a good fellow. He spent a lot of time not only in Claire, 
but down in Detroit, in the Leland Hotel, um, where he uh, often went uh, to, in one of his attempts to become sober, because by now he's become a serious uh, alcoholic. And this is going to play into the, the whole denouement here. So Jack is in Claire, Le Lebov is in Claire, and Lebov, not to be taken just as a gangster or just somebody trying to get these purples out of prison, but we should think of him also as a loving family person who was good to his mother, among other people. Here are his parents in their wedding picture, um, and um, he kept a very close touch with his parents throughout his life. His father actually lived with him in Clare for a time. He uh, hired a nephew, Sam uh, Brownstein, here, his wife's, uh, this child of one of his wife's uh, sisters, uh, worked with Mammoth Oil in uh, Clare. Um, here is uh, Florence uh, here, uh, Pugh and Tom Pugh that we have mentioned before that he stays very close with. And um, most importantly for my own work, um, this is uh, one of his sister, his sister Anne. This is his sister Anne. This is um, uh, Anne's, one of Anne's daughters, um, Lebov's niece, uh, who is still a living and provided uh, the only um, first-hand detailed information um, that I was able to find uh, from someone who'd actually known uh, Lebov. And here she is in Claire. This is actually in Claire. This is her younger uh, brother because she lived with Lebov for a number of years in Claire. So Isaiah Lebov and his dogs, Isaiah Lebov, the family man. In Claire, he bought a, town, a place outside of town, north of town, just beyond the Tobacco River, on the opposite Pettit, what is today Pettit Park. It was, this house actually was owned by Walter Pettit. He fixed it up and he called it Wildwood. It's still there today. He called it Wildwood. He increased the, uh, the size. He landscaped the whole area. He built an eight-foot fence around the whole thing and made it into a, um, a, 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 an animal preserve. And this is uh, Joan Kaplan um, here, about age 12 or 13, um, in front of Wildwood, uh, one of the summers she spent in Clare. This Wildwood was huge. This is the bridge over the Tobacco River. This is Pettit Park here. All of this, 70 some acres, were part of Wildwood. And he imported deer, he had a declared a conservation area. It was very, uh, he was very serious about this. Um, as a um, as a Clarite, and here you see that he's just before um, he died, um, he was improving the house significantly, and this is the house as it was when it was finally finished. But that was only after he died. This estate can be yours for a million dollars or so if you want to retire to Clare. Um, here's the house today, as it is today, just as it was before. You can have a pond out and back. You can have a barbecue. This is an old cottage on the grounds where Livingston stayed when he stayed with them before they had their falling out. And you could wander around the back. And I want to know if anybody knows what this thing is. This was in the back, uh, back by the lake. And I've asked lots of people, no idea what this contraption was. It looks old, but um, maybe somebody here will know what it is. Okay, so we're in Claire. Claire, and there are gangsters in Claire. How exactly does it work that there are gangsters in this small Michigan town? Well, Willard Bicknell, who's one of the main sources for my information uh, because of uh, interviews that Forrest Meek um, made and transcribed, Walter Bick Willard Bicknell of Bicknell Store, the Bicknell um, uh, dry goods store there, um, said that they really kept to themselves. The gangsters pretty much kept to themselves. They came to the Doherty, they did their business in the Doherty, they went back to Detroit, they really just pretty much kept to themselves. Um, did they cause any uh, trouble? He said, nah, nah, they never did. They just kept to themselves. John Dunlop, however, he's the mayor, um, he's the, um, uh, the guy on the right, um, with William, his brother, the police chief on the left, if you don't think they controlled Claire in 1938, then got another thing coming. Um, but uh, William uh, Dunlop, the police, uh, the police chief, he's on the left, 
actually socialized with the Bernsteins, went down to Detroit, had dinner with them in their, um, in their, their palatial layout uh, in Detroit, um, and was, uh, was pretty close. And, but at least according to uh, Bicknell, once they were in Claire, then everything was on a, a, a professional basis. There was no, um, there, there was no um, you know, gangsterism going on just because uh, William happened to be, Bill happened to be the, the police chief. So what about regular Clareites? Well, I've been able to track down a number of uh, people who actually remember little snippets of knowing these gangsters. Uh, Betty Hampton, I just uh, talked with last week. Um, she's the daughter of a, uh, one mayor, Ike, and her, her grandfather, and her father was also mayor, Jesse. Um, so I asked her, um, I mean, these people dealt with the gangsters, did you ever see them? Um, and she said, well, no, they never came to the house. They never came to our house. Um, we sort of knew, but it was all hush-hush. I asked Gail Soule if he remembered um, any, of the, any of the gangsters, and he said, well, yeah, because one day Joan uh, Kaplan, the, the girl in the picture there, who was in high school at that point in Claire, um, her uh, chauffeur came, didn't come to pick her up uh, to take her back to Wildwood. So I gave her a ride back to Wildwood. Now, I'm going to tell you that that Joan was a good-looking young lady, so I'm not surprised that Gail was interested in this way. Um, but he sort of laughed and said, well, they called this guy, the guy's name's Levinson, uh, Levinson uh, chauffeur, but we knew he was a bodyguard. Then there's Virgil McClinic, who I, I this is third hand from, uh, from Virgil's granddaughter. Um, it, on the, the wedding anniversary of Virgil and his wife, uh, a truckload of roses appeared, um, and as well, a full gear of deep sea fishing stuff came to the door of the McClintocks uh, with the best regards of the Purple Gang. And the final little anecdote, Harold Loomis was a barber, um, and um, one of the gangsters named Arthur Clark, who lived on Wheaton Avenue, um, called up Harold and said, can you come and give me a haircut in my home? Harold said, well, sure, I can come and give you a haircut in your home. So he goes over to the, the house on Wheaton Avenue and starts setting up and looks over and sees this guy on the couch, lying out, out on the couch with a pistol, uh, with a, a, shoulder, a shoulder pistol. And uh, uh, Harold said he, was, he never went back there to give another, give another haircut. So these are just little anecdotes, but, it, but the bottom line is that um, pretty much the gangsters kept to themselves. There was never any gang activity in Claire itself. It was all uh, neutral ground, um, and, um, and the, the regular Clareites pretty much uh, um, either avoided them or only had um, uh, slight contact. Then on May 14, 1938, in the bar of the Doherty Hotel, Lee Bob is shot and killed. And he's shot and killed by his erstwhile friend, Jack Livingston. So Jack claimed that he had been cheated on oil leases. And there's nothing worse than cheating an oil, a lease man on oil leases. Um, and he held a, uh, this grudge against Lebov and also was, think, was afraid that Lebov was going to sick the Purple Gang on him and have him rubbed out. So he decided he needed to get Lebov first. So they were, in the, they were in the bar of the Doherty Hotel. It's 9.45. Jack comes in. He sees that Lebov is there. He decides he's got to do it. He goes up to his room. He gets his 38. He comes back down to the bar, stands in front of Lebov, and, well, you heard the, you heard the shots. Three, three shots. He then goes back up to his room, and about 10 minutes later, of course, a small town, uh, the chief of police, Dunlop, comes up to his room, knocks on the door. Jack opens the door. Jack says, did I get him? And Dunlop says, you got him, Jack. So there was no doubt who murdered this guy. So he's taken into custody, put in the Claire uh, jail. Um, he is, um, uh, there's an inquest, and there is a, of course, visiting the scene of the crime. So here, here's, here are the brothers, uh, the Dunlops. Here's Jack just after the, uh, the murder, that is the day after the murder. 
Here they are, it's a slatterly a doctor, a local doctor. Here's a blood-stained floor of the Doherty, uh, of the Doherty bar, and these guys um, looking at it. And one of the witnesses drew this picture of where everybody was uh, sitting. Here's the bar. It's not, that's not where it is now. Uh, a nice diagram of where everybody was sitting when, um, when Jack did the deed. This made news all over the state and indeed nationally. It went out on AP wire. Um, the, the, the inquest here, they're all huddled around here looking at the, this is the inquest jury, um, looking at the blood-stained floor. And <clears throat> the cameras descended upon uh, Livingston and he was a great talker. He didn't mind telling everybody that he'd done this to save the country and that Leibov was a terrible person and was trying to kill him and, um, and so on. He was very upfront about that. So there's a trial late in 1938. And there is a team that's brought together, uh, Ryan, Noms, and uh, Goggin. Um, Ryan, James Ryan from Clare, Joseph Noms from uh, Mount Pleasant, and um, Charles Goggin from Alma. His grandson um, shared with me the, um, the scrapbook that his, father, his grandfather kept during, uh, during the trial. Trial here in the old uh, Harrison uh, courthouse. Um, Livingston's brother Julius came up to be with him, lend him support. Lots of local people were in the bar. I mean, there were, there were 50 people in the bar and 25 witnesses were, were called. And at various times, um, uh, local, uh, in the newspaper, pictures of, of various of the, um, uh, of the witnesses appeared. Well, one of the most interesting witnesses is Kuno Hammerberg, a doctor in Clare, very important um, witness in talking about uh, his, the state of mind that, that Livingston had. But in Kuno's autobiography, he never mentions the murder, never mentions Livingston, never mentions Leibov. So I would give a lot to know why he decided to erase that particular uh, event from, uh, from his, his uh, autobiography. Livingston was never called to the, um, was never called to the stand. The case was made by the prosecution that um, the, this was an out-and-out murder, um, that uh, drunkenness was not an excuse for murder, and everyone was perfectly willing to admit that, Le that Livingston was drunk at the time, as he usually was. Um, the defense claimed that uh, he was not drunk, but that he was insane. And they trotted up a lot of psychi psychiatrists, psychologists, whatever, from Traverse City and from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, down south uh, to say that he, was, um, that he was crazy, not that he was uh, just drunk. So in the end, that worked. So he's acquitted on, a, uh, on the plea of insanity. And this is a very, <clears throat> very interesting um, um, result because it, in one other famous case, um, the next year, actually caused the Michigan law on insanity to be changed. So you couldn't just, here's what happened. He goes to trial. He, they, they, they say he's uh, acquitted on the grounds of insanity. He's required to undergo psychiatric examination. That happens in January. They declare that he's then sane, <clears throat> and he goes free. That law was changed about two years later. Um, but so, so he walks away, he walks away a, um, a free man. So what happened to these people? Lee Bob is dead, of course. He's buried in Pittsburgh next to his, uh, next to his father. Um, the, the result of maybe just a crazy person who was angry at him, um, but there were reasons why the Purples might have wanted him out of the way as well. But he's gone. What about the other people? What happens to the other people? What happens to Enid? Well, Enid was a very um, unstable person. And <clears throat> she goes back to Toronto for a time, where her family came from, and then uh, wanders about the country um, and goes to Houston and, and, and Colorado, has a house in Evanston, Illinois, and finally ends up in Pasadena, California where she is admitted to a psychiatric hospital and almost immediately uh, hangs herself with a towel from her door frame. So that's in 1949. 
So that's how Enid ends her days. What about Jack? What happens to Jack? Jack is um, read out of the Livingston family. Uh, the Livingston family actually was quite fond of Enid and of, uh, of Isaiah Lebov, and they had just had it with Jack and his drunkenness and his showboat and so on. <clears throat> so he, he was not allowed back to the family uh, home in Tulsa. He ends up in New York, um, and on April 2nd, 1950, in the Pic Piccadilly Hotel, he takes a uh, overdose of sleeping pills and commits suicide. In his room was found a yellow 1928 newspaper, which I showed you earlier, the one where it says he's going to make the round the world flight. So yeah, we have to imagine that when Jack died, he wasn't thinking of murdering his friend Isaiah Lebov uh, or, or anything of the sort, but rather remembering what he thought of as his glory days as a, a famous person. Sam Garfield, what happens to Sam Garfield, the, the person that Lebov worked with extensively in the 1930s in Clare? Sam stays in Clare um, in, the, in the 1940s. He becomes involved with casinos, uh, Bugsy Siegel and people like that, big time um, gangsters. Um, and also uh, Mo Dalitz, the head of the uh, gang in Cleveland. Um, he um, hooks up with uh, Meyer Lansky uh, and actually brings Meyer Lansky to Claire in the 1960s when there's another oil boom. Or the boom, let it isn't as big as the one in the 30s. But he brings Meyer Lansky to Claire, gets him to invest in oil wells. Meyer Lansky stays in the Doherty Hotel. Um, but uh, Sam Garfield and his gangsters, well, that's another story. So that's death at the Doherty. Thank you very much.